This video builds upon our previous discussion of central tendency, mean, and, and median um, to introduce the descriptive ways that you can use to summarize numeric data, especially those that discuss the dispersion or the variability of values in that data set. So, as we saw before, statistical samples contain many individual observations or values, and it's important, therefore, to have some kind of way to summarize the characteristics of that data set. And so you learned in the previous video about measures of the central tendency or the average, and this video introduces measures of dispersion or the variability of values in the data. And we'll move on later on to discussing ways that you can use statistical hypothesis tests to distinguish between dispersion and different samples. But for now, we'll just talk about the measures themselves. So dispersion is just a technical term for variability, which describes how spread out the data points are around the center of the data, uh, with the center usually being measured by the, the mean. So the simplest way to measure dispersion is just to calculate the distance from each point to the mean. Because points that are smaller than the mean will have a negative distance, they'll tend to cancel out the points that, the, that are larger than the mean. So to get around that, we square those distances. This will convert the negative distances into positive numbers. This is then added up to give us something called the sum of squares. And the sum of squares is an extremely widespread um, way of measuring dispersion. You'll definitely see it um, later on in, in this course as well. So just as, as an aside, you might be wondering why the values are squared. Why don't we just take the absolute value, which would also help get rid of those negative numbers? Well, it, it's partly just convention, but also the sum of squares and the squaring of the values does have some benefits. It's mathematically easier to find the value that minimizes that, for example. But anyhow, the sum of squares isn't used on its own to quantify dispersion because its value um, will vary with the sample size. So the sum of squares for a thousand data points will obviously be larger than the sum of squares for, for just one. And as I said, you know, we'll see this later on. It comes back again and again in, in different statistical tests. So dispersion is instead measured by something called the variance, um, which is given the symbol S squared for the sample variance. And we just divide the sum of squares by n minus 1, where n is the number of values in the sample or, or the sample size, essentially. So why n minus 1? Why not divide just by the sample size n? Well, this is related to something called degrees of freedom, uh, which is probably easiest to illustrate with, with an example. So let's consider a small sample of, of just five values. If you know the first values are 4 and 6 and 6 and 4, what could the fifth value be? Well, I mean, it could be anything. I mean, you might guess it's something but like 4 or 6, but it could be 15 or 4.5. We have really no idea. There's no constraints on what this can be. But let's imagine the similar situation where we have the same data set, 4, 6, 6, and 4, but now we know that the average or the mean is 5. So if these first four values are 4, 6, 6, and 4, in this case the final value could only be 5. Because given that the mean is 5, the average of those things has to be 5. So in this case, if we know n minus 1, if we know the first 4, and we know the mean, this final value has no freedom to vary. It has no degrees of freedom. It must be one thing. It must be 5. So this is essentially why, if you look at the formula for variance, the mean is in there. So we're essentially using um, one of the degrees of freedom to calculate the mean. So variance is calculated as the sum of squares divided by n minus 1 because we only have n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We've used one of them to estimate the sample mean from the data itself. And so the sample variance, s squared, is an unbiased estimate of the population variance, which is sigma squared. And unbiased just means that there's no tendency, for, it's not going to be high or low, I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but it's not going to be biased or deliberate in a higher direction or, or a smaller direction from the population value. So because the sum of squares and variance, therefore, is measured in the original data unit squared, it's kind of awkward. Um, for that reason, if we want to describe dispersion in writing, if we want to say the variability of this data set is something, um, 
it's more common to report something called the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. And so because we take the square root, standard deviation is the same units as the original data. If we've measured, uh, you know, rock chemistry in parts per million, if we have the size of something in millimeters, the standard deviation will also be in parts per million or in millimeters. <clears throat> and so remember, that this is the sample standard deviation, or S, and it's the estimate of the population standard deviation. Right, statistics is always trying to estimate a population parameter from the sample that we have. So you may have noticed that the formula for variance, and also therefore for standard deviation, uses the mean as one of its inputs. And you've also learned that the mean isn't a great measure of the central tendency when the data are strongly skewed. So as a result, variance and standard deviation aren't great measures of dispersion in cases where the data is strongly skewed. So instead, there's something else that you can use called the interquartile range. So any data set can be divided into four quartiles. The lower 25%, the second 25%, the third 25%, and the upper 25%. And so the interquartile range is just the range spanned by the middle 50% of those data points, which is the dark green shading in this, in this histogram here. So it extends from the lower quartile, 25% of the data points are smaller than that, to the upper quartile, where 25% are, are larger. So in this example, the lower quartile is between 0 and 17.7 or so. Upper quartile is about 59 to 400-ish. Um, so the interquartile range is about 58.7 minus 17.7, or 41 parts per million in this case. So sometimes you see interquartile range given as the actual range, like 17.68 to 58.69. Sometimes you see it just as a single number, which is the, the difference between those two. You sometimes see those interchangeably, but in R, and it'll give you, and if you want to report one value for dispersion, you want to report just a single number there. So one other thing, so even if the data does have a symmetrical distribution and variance is, is okay, there's still one additional complication with variance or standard deviations. And so because the deviations in our sum of squares is measured from the mean, the magnitude of those sum of squares, and therefore the variance of the animation will tend to be larger when the mean itself is larger. This is a common relationship. So, you know, if, if the mean is only 0.001, the standard deviation is going to be similarly small. But if the mean is a million, the standard deviation could be 1,000 or 10,000 or something like that. So if you want to compare standard, if you want to compare variability in things where they're on very different scales, you need to use something else. And so this can be, a, this can be done by calculating something called the coefficient of variation, or CV. Um, which is just a standard deviation s divided by the mean, or this x bar. And these are the sample parameters. Remember, we're always using the sample parameters to estimate the population parameters. Um, so this sample coefficient of variation is just the estimate of the population one. Coefficient of variation isn't as widely used as, as standard deviation, but as I said, it can be very useful for comparing dispersion or variability if the two measurements are in different units, or if the means are very different, and if that difference is important. So this is where you would use coefficient of variation. If the data types are different, let's say we want to compare, like, is pH more variable than carbon isotope composition? Well, they have different units and so and different scales, and so it doesn't make sense that you know, they shouldn't have comparable standard deviations. Um, it's also important to note that the coefficient of variation is only meaningful if all the data values are positive. So you can't use it if you have negative numbers. Um, and also be sort of be warned that the calculated number is going to be very sensitive to change if the mean is close to zero. We're divided by very tiny numbers, and so the coefficient of variation can fluctuate a lot for very small changes in the mean if the mean is 0 0.001 or something like that. So here's an illustrated example of when you might want to use coefficient of variation. So say you want to know whether large earthquakes occur more regularly in Japan or in Cascadia in North America. So this is just made up numbers here, um, but it says that the mean time between earthquakes in Japan is 100 years and it's 400 years in Cascadia. 
on the standard deviation of the time between earthquakes is 20 years in Japan and, and 40 years in Cascade. So you had a long time series of earthquakes and you measured the time between them, kind of the standard deviation of those times between earthquakes. So it looks like the Japan subduction zone is, is more regular, less variable, has a lower standard deviation, but also notice that the means are quite different. And so if that difference is important, which in this made up data it is, um, we would then calculate the coefficient of variation instead. So standard deviation divided by mean. Japan is 0 20 divided by 100 or 0 0.2. Cascadia is 40 divided by 400 or, or 0 0.1. So the conclusion is actually the opposite. Earthquake timing in Japan in this made up data at least seems more variable than in Cascadia. So another example for using coefficient of variability could say, be say if you want to compare the variability of pH levels and temperature in, in a bunch of different lakes. Uh, pH and temperature are measured in different units, and so it wouldn't make sense to compare standard deviations because those also have those same units. Uh, you know, pH units versus degrees Celsius. And so the coefficient of variation is basically a non-dimensional method of comparing variability. So when you practice uh, with the, the exercises, you'll get to the chance to decide whether um, standard deviation or interquartile range is the appropriate or the most appropriate measure. Um, you also get a chance to, to practice identifying situations where the coefficient of variation is, is a reasonable thing to use. And so these measures of dispersion are, are generally very important things to, to report when you give summaries of important data or important conclusions in, in written reports, um, when you're describing data you know, for your own research or for projects that you're working on.